This question about what makes humans special is an incredibly narcissistic question. We're not asking about what makes every other species special, we're just asking about us. Yeah, we're interesting, but like, we're not echolocating bats. Like, we're not like elephants who have these incredible social structures. Sometimes the things that make humans special also are kind of problems for our species. I mean, look at our technology. Look at our sophisticated politics. We might learn more stuff if we focused not on ourselves, but on other species. Yeah, so we're looking at Cayo Santiago, which is the Monkey Island. Um, it's about, I think, like a mile and a half off the coast of mainland Puerto Rico. Um, and soon we're going to hop on a little boat that's going to take us out there. Looks very quiet from here, but there's lots of monkeys on there. You might not know it from just like, oh, it's that island that's filled with monkeys. So the big question in our field is this question of what makes humans special. Really, the way to ask that question is to ask whether other animals have some of the cool capacities that we have. Go cafe grande con azúcar. But there's a big list, right? Humans are super weird. We have art and culture and language. I don't know if my students are out there yet, but we can head this And that's what we do in my field, comparative cognition. We pick this cool thing that humans do, and we try to ask, can we ask whether or not other animals do that? The ones that we've made a lot of progress on is kind of thinking about whether we're special in the way we think about other people's minds. <gasps> hey, Bobby, come on. Can you sit? You don't know how to sit. Sit. And there's been this real question about whether another animal can do that. Like, can they think about what somebody else is thinking? And this is one of the things that we try to test um, out with the monkeys. Have, um, you want non-shiny glass. Non so not yeah. these ones. No, yeah, they don't like that. I don't, see? That's good advice. I was, yeah, I didn't. They'll see themselves and it'll be very threatening. Ah, okay. So Cayo Santiago was set up as a research station back in the 1930s. The scientist Carpenter had the idea, why don't we get a group of monkeys that could be close to American scientists where we could set them up, control their environment, and try to look at how they behave, how they make sense of the world. At the time, I think other scientists thought he was a little bit crazy. But what he did was he headed over to Asia, picked up a couple hundred rhesus monkeys, took a long boat ride to Puerto Rico, and dropped them off. And now those monkeys treat it like they're home. What, I mean, what is the main motivation for you? Yeah, I yeah. find it's really hard to test humans by testing humans. Like, to get down to human cognition without all that extra stuff is hard. Isn't all that extra stuff part of human cognition? Right? If you find the perfect state without that stuff, that'll okay. be important too. And the beauty of the monkeys, as you'll see, is like they're not doing any of that. They're just being monkeys. It looks very Jurassic Parky. However, we're walking around the island, find a path that's like furthest from all monkeys. Um, staring at them right in the face is like a threat. And the moms are most jittery when right. they're with their babies. So between, uh... Definitely, if you see babies, try to keep your yeah. distance. <laughs> Guys, you're supposed to wait till we have our big entrance, man. <laughs> they're keen for TV as well. I mean, they yeah. <laughs> they're like, hello. Just want to for the camera. <laughs> My close up. So he's like an adult male. Right. So Cayo Santiago is home to about 1,500 monkeys right now with six different social groups on the island. So how close is this to the natural habitat they might have come from in India? So macaques are the most ubiquitous primate other than humans. OK. So it's hard to say what like the real macaque environment is, because nowadays they live in cities. They live kind of all over. 
The island is pretty fun for the monkeys because humans don't live there. We keep all our stuff in cages. It's kind of their home. I think they're patiently waiting. That's all their food in the truck. And so they're like, why did I not get fed? But they're really habituated to humans because we've been kicking around with them for the last 80 years. But that means we get this incredible way of observing them up close and personal without affecting their behavior. So that structure there is a food corral, wow. okay. which is where one of the places they feed the monkeys. Okay. So we're going to also get a, a little poolside show. So those are a bunch of kid monkeys who are going to go for it. But it's like, That's it's brilliant. so high, right? <laughs> is they having fun? Yeah, this is playing. One of the big puzzles still in primate cognition generally is this question about whether the monkeys can think about the minds of others. So our group does cognition work down here, which means we're really setting up experiments and trying to manipulate the monkey's environment to see what's going on. If monkeys know what other individuals see, they should use that information in productive ways. And one productive way is in the context of deception. We gotta find a nail or like a stick. So what are you making? We're gonna make a little platform for them to steal grapes off of. We set up a really simple experiment. We give them the opportunity to steal stuff from humans. This study was born of watching them do this basic thing to us, like steal food from us when we weren't paying attention all right. the time. Right. And so we just operationalized it in an actual test where we're like, Let's literally give them food that they could steal from us and see if they can do it. We're going to find a monkey, hopefully one that's by themselves, which is yeah. hard because we've seen they're very social. This experiment is a first pass to see, can they use any of the social abilities they have to like deceive us? Are they sensitive to this simple thing of what we can see and what we can't see? Take one step towards them like this, and then now Hold your platform horizontal like this and show him the grape. And then place the grape down onto the shish kebab bit. Mm -hmm. Good. Now we're going to put the platform on the... Hey, wait. No, buddy. You got to wait. Here, step back. Take your grape off. Yeah, he's very forceful. No, now you don't get to play because you're being mean. We could try again, but let's do it from slightly further back. Hey, monkey. Okay, turn around. All right, he's. So I've no idea stop. what's going on. One sec, on. you can turn, you can turn can, around and I grab the grip. Yep. And turn around. Anything happening? He's still staring at the film crew a little bit. Now he's threatening the film crew again. I'm trying to like just stare off into the distance and pretend yeah. I'm not paying attention. Typically, when we run these studies, it's just two people, two grapes, no one else is around. When one person's turned away, they really kind of feel like they can sneak over and grab something. Um, this is a little bit hard today because there are a bunch of people around. Most of the monkeys we tried to test, we did the setup, everything was fine, and they kind of glanced around and stared at the scary camera person as though, you know, that guy's not looking, but you're looking at me, there's no way I'm gonna steal this grape. And so, um, in some ways we found that the monkeys are as good at tracking others' perspective as we think. It just wasn't the perspective that we were typically looking at. It was tracking the camera person and the sound guy's perspective, not tracking uh, the experimenter's perspective. And it fits with our hypothesis, right? The hypothesis if monkeys see people are paying attention, they just hold back. They don't steal from anyone. When you think about our ability to think about other minds, on the one hand, that was a huge innovation, right? It allowed us to make films like this, it allowed us to have literature, probably allowed us to do politics and negotiate and so on. But it also means we're outside of our heads a lot, right? There are modern movements to try to shut that off, to stop mind wandering, to stop worrying about what others are thinking. And it takes a tremendous amount of work, you know, like rich Buddhist training to sit there and get back in your own head. And so on the one hand, we have this wonderful capacity that makes us special, that lets us do these things, but it also means we probably have these costs that other animals just don't face, which we also want to understand and, and improve for our own species. What's fascinating here, I mean, we just tried this, this experiment and it didn't, really, it didn't really quite work. I guess that's pretty normal out here where things are very uncontrolled. You assume somebody's doing one thing, you design your, your experiments to test this, this one idea of what might be going on, and quite often they're doing something entirely different. I mean, to be a scientist, you have to do a couple things. One is you have to deal with uncertainty all the time. The second is just the basis of the scientific method is having people show that you're wrong. 
We often misunderstand what it means to succeed in science. When we don't get the results we expect, it can be telling us something really important. You know, you have some hypothesis and you run the study and like, ah, oh, it didn't work. It's like, no, it worked. Like, we got an answer. Like, we got information and we can use that information to constrain something later. And so that's, that's kind of a hard thing to realize is something, sometimes our predictions are just wrong and that's okay. When you show scientists as real people who have real excitement over these questions, who dig it, right, who are just like, that is cool that we just have no idea and we have to work much harder. We're like trying to solve a really long mystery novel all the time. And we get to the end of the chapter and we think we've made progress, but then there's a new door and a new twist. Humanizing science, I think that can be really powerful.